All right, we're here with David Border Giles, an anthropologist, and um, anthropologist of, of an area that's that's gotten a lot of attention of late. Economic anthropology has mm, been a sort mm -hmm. of revival of both political and economic mm, anthropology mm -hmm. of late. Um, so could you just tell us a little bit about what your current research is about? Absolutely. Well, it all starts in the dumpster uh, and builds from there. I've done a lot of dumpster diving and a lot of food recovery. Just for those not in the know, what is dumpster diving? Mm. Well, there is a lot of edible food. Well, a lot of useful things in general that get thrown away because they don't have any exchange value anymore. And so we go through dumpsters and recover it. And especially commercial dumpsters, a lot of it gets thrown away. A lot of it gets thrown away by your average uh, Joe consumer. But also a lot of it gets thrown away by shops and retailers and, and middlemen before it even reaches the consumer just because for one reason or another, they deem it cheaper to pull it from the shelf, chuck it and put new things onto the shelf. So dumpster divers comb through that and recover anything that still has a use value, even if it has no exchange value, as far as the retailer is concerned. What's the, what's the definition of exchange mm. or use value? Absolutely. Uh, well, exchange value is f not quite as simple as the price that you'd pay for it, but it's uh, in economic terms, it's the market value of a thing. Of a thing. Mm -hmm. It's how much they can make from selling it. Um, whereas use value is anything you might use it for. So a thing can be a million different sorts of use values. You know, a banana can be uh, a banana. It can also be banana bread if it's got a few spots on it. But if it's got too many spots on it, it doesn't have an exchange value because no one's going to pay, you know, however many dollars a pound for spotty bananas when they can get the nice ones next to it. So the exchange value becomes negated, but it's still got a million and one use values. Is there a difference in use value depending on the person? Absolutely. Absolute. Well, for example, dumpster divers find use value in things that other people might shy away from. Sometimes it takes being a bit more inventive, uh, and sometimes it just takes not being, uh, not being too squeamish. So use value can be anything you make of it. Um, exchange Give us an example of mm. something that you've uh, dumpstered and uh, oh. a use value that maybe for most people wouldn't mm. be of use and, and how you've re reimagined the use of a particular thing that you found. <laughs> oh, I've looked, I've found so many things in the dumpster. Um, most of it's edible stuff that's just got a spot on it. So it's useful to me because I don't care about the spot. Whereas if you're in the shop, you'll pass over it and, and you can see people doing this and I still do this. You go to the, the produce aisle and find the avocado that's just right uh, and pass over the ones that are a bit too soft. So on the most everyday level, uh, making a use value out of something means consciously picking the one that's got a spot, you know, or consciously overlooking the spot. Um, often it means making banana bread because they're not good to eat anymore, but they're, they're still pretty good for banana bread. And so what, what, what does anthropology bring to the study of dumpsters and mm. the study of value or the differences in value? Well, it helps us think about a commodity as a flexible cultural reality, one that's subjective and one that's uh, subject to a lot of different cultural perspectives. So most of the time, commodities are thought of in terms of their exchange value. They're all very quantitative. They're measured in terms of uh, a sliding scale of supply and demand and at a certain point they stop being profitable uh, and so they're not treated as negotiable and anthropologists know about fetishism and about ritual objects in general and about how dependent they are on the relationships that they're embedded in. So a gift is an economic fact because of your relationship to someone and a commodity is an economic fact because of your relationship to people too, but those relationships are relationships to wholesalers, relationships to the farmer, or relationships to the kids that you're going to feed when you bring it home. Uh, so those relationships are what make the commodity a fact, and that gets left out of exchange value and left out of all the economic calculations. So anthropologists are very good at noting the cultural commodity relationships that make an economy possible. Mm. And talk about the relationships. Um, is there also a political project inherent in wanting to change the way we see commodities? Mm. It's true. We've often been pegged as being a little bit radical uh, and a little bit left of centre because we don't take the 
assumptions of our current economy for granted. Anthropologists know that there have been a million and one different sorts of economies throughout human history and that in fact there still are a million and one different economies right now under our nose, just not the ones we hear about. So we pay attention to the full spectrum of human economic activity, gifts, uh, markets, unpaid labour. Uh, so we don't often think about those as economies, but they're work that we do for other people in relationship to other people, they're productive sorts of labour. So anthropologists pay attention to the full spectrum of that and that is inherently a kind of criticism of the predominant political assumptions about what an economy can be. You know, whenever a, pol a politician talks about what's good for the economy, they have a very narrow definition of what's good for the economy. So anthropologists are sort of by necessity, rabble rousers and by necessity a bit radical because they don't take those assumptions for granted. But do you think that um, as a whole, especially in the West, we're, we're not um, engaging the, the use value of things as much as we should perhaps, and we're too mm -hmm. driven by the exchange value of our own labour as well as the things that we consume? Oh, absolutely. Well, that's, now, we, now we're really getting political, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, certainly what we can do is hold up the full spectrum of our, uh, our behaviours to people and let the results speak for themselves. So one of the things I do with my work is just talk about how much waste there is and reveal to people uh, how not rubbish the rubbish is. So I, when I give talks, I often bring in something that I've dumpster dived. I'll make banana bread if I can help it. I'll bring it in and share it around. Um, and sometimes I wait until after I've, after I've shared it to tell people that it's from the dumpster. Mm. So. So there's a project in trying to get people to, to notice and rethink their relationship to commodities as well. Absolutely. Mm. But when, um, as, as anthropologists, mm -hmm. you see our role then to critique the status quo um, and to mm -hmm. resurrect you know, other economies, other mm -hmm. ways of, of engaging and living economically? Absolutely, like. absolutely. Um, or is it just about documenting other ways of dumpster divers, um, mm. people who are sh living in a sharing economy. I can't see a difference between those two projects. I think we okay. live in a moment in which people use the word human nature as if it's self-evident and they tie a particular model of human nature to the economy. People say, well, of course it's just human nature to be selfish. Of course it's just human nature to compete. It's just human nature to try to accumulate as much wealth as you can possibly accumulate. And those all turn out to be absolute hogwash if you look at the full spectrum of human, human behaviour. But it's absolute hogwash that has the seal of truth. It's absolute hogwash that has the seal of economic truth because a certain narrow vision of uh, economics and a certain narrow vision of political history says that sort of rational individual actor trying to, trying to accomplish the best for him or herself will do the best for all of us. Uh, sort of Adam Smith's invisible hand has the seal of truth. So documenting the fact that it has not always been so, it is not always so, is inherently a critique. And I don't think we have to come out and make uh, too many bones about that for it to work as a critique. I guess my question is more, you mm. know, whether anthropologists should be activists mm. um, and through their own work, mm. um, politicize their own work in that way or, or and, and you know, be activists, game changers, be mm, actively mm -hmm. involved in the change they, they're interested Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Or should they be more, um, not, not necessarily objective, but stand outside of what they're mm. describing and document it and mm. just write about it? Oh, I'm really fond of this question. <laughs> um, oh, and it's a big one too, isn't it? You know, our, to me, Anthropology is, and I know this is, this is controversial, to me when I think of anthropology, anthropology is fundamentally tied it up with participant observation. It's fundamentally tied up with a method which is itself a kind of activism, to me. Uh, and so it's got that hyphen between objective and subjective. You're participating and observing at the same time and you can't do one without the other. So I think ethnography and anthropology has to be a sort of activism but not, not a, an activism that adheres to a party platform, not an activism that has a specific agenda. 
but an activism that's based on uh, based on an ethic of empathy. You have to help live the lives of other people and empathise with them in order to come back with anything meaningful to say about them. And you have to, therefore, accept a diversity of possibilities and a diversity of points of view. That's absolutely activism and that's absolutely an ethical engagement. And then what you do with that, anthropologists have done a lot of different things with that, can vary enormously. You can come back and, and write them up as savages from your armchair and anthropologists have done that. Or you can come back and write uh, op-eds and articles for your local newspaper advocating for a particular group of people who, uh, who wouldn't get hurt otherwise. All of those things are activism from different points of view, but they're all based on the same fundamental ethic of empathy. I like that ethic of empathy. And in a way, is that could that be your definition of anthropology? Mm. Or do you have a sort of two-sentence two definition? Oh, anthropology's... Well, two sentences or half an hour. Nothing in between. Anthropology... A short definition. <laughs> it's the study of ourselves, right? But ourselves as we know ourselves through difference. It's not psychology, it's not philosophy, it's not meditation. And yet, anthropos means us. So it's the study of us as we differ from ourselves. So there's absolutely a, a core empathetic, compassionate feeling in anthropology, or at least I reckon there ought to be. Mm. Well, that, again, might be a political project <laughs> inherent in that. Um, in, in your work, um, you worked in the US on, mm. your, on your thesis. Do you think there was a, there's a specific um, quality to you know, a, a country that is all about consumerism, where the economy is, is so mm -hmm. you know, saturized with images of consume more, mm -hmm. um, consume fancy looking things, and mm -hmm. you know, the advertising industry of everything looks just perfect. Mm -hmm. um, that there's, it's, it's even harder to talk about different use values mm. when, there's, when people every day get saturized with images of mm. perfection. That's right. After September 11th, we all remember George Bush going on television and telling Americans it was their duty as Americans to shop, go out and support the economy. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I wasn't planning on studying that to begin with. And through living in the US, and I lived in Seattle when I was doing my research, I couldn't avoid it. I couldn't, I couldn't not write about it. You know, I, I think anthropologists have a duty not just to travel far and wide and bring back stories about the diversity of humanity, but to stop exactly where they are and look in their own backyard and dig up the, uh, the familiar that turns out to be strange. Mm. So I ended up doing that. And that's one of the strangest things about living in the United States is the, uh, the shocking amount of consumption and the shocking amount of waste that lives right next door to the shocking amount of scarcity. You know, unless any, any viewers from Australia are thinking, ho, 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 uh, isn't America a funny case? It's happening in Australia too, and it's happening in New Zealand where I was teaching last year. It's happening all over the place. So one of the things I've been really deliberate about is using an anthropological lens to look at uh, Western cities, and especially this particular kind of Western city that's proliferating. So cities like Melbourne and Sydney in Australia or Auckland in Christchurch are all following this model, which partly comes from the US. They partly have a vision of a New York or a San Francisco that they're aspiring to. And these are places of uh, great world-class consumption and, and they're a mark of success somehow. What do you mean by world-class consumption? Mm, they have, uh, well, if you, if you travel on the airline and you uh, have nothing else to read, there's the magazine in the, the back of the seat pocket, which tells you how to travel. And it always tells you about how wonderful the shopping is in Beijing or Abu Dhabi. It always tells you about uh, what you should do when you get to such and such a city. And so there's, a, there's an aesthetic, there's a cultural aesthetic of world-classness that makes a city seem like a destination that we ought to go and it makes it seem like a model that we ought to aspire to. 
Uh, so that world-classness is expensive and it comes with a lot of waste. So I didn't know how to avoid that as, a, as an anthropologist. That, w that seemed like it had to be tackled somehow. I mean, that's a, actually sort of a segue to another question mm -hmm. I always ask is, how, how did you, what, what's the journey of, of you from growing up mm. to ending up in a dumpster <laughs> to, and <laughs> writing about it and writing about what you're finding there. Mm. What was the journey to anthropology? How did you become an anthropologist? Was it mm. those sort of questions that you were confronted with or did it start before that? Mm. Oh, I think there are two pieces of it. I think I became an anthropologist because I was always already an inveterate people watcher. And I don't know where that started. I think anthropologists are always a little bit out of place. I always say if you go to a party, you can pick the anthropologists because they're standing at the edge of the room watching people. Taking notes. <laughs> mm, mental notes. And I think I started off watching people early on. I did a lot of traveling from the US to Australia and back and never really knew where I belonged. And I think most of us start somehow not knowing where we fit in. So I think that has a lot to do with the people watching. And once I realized I was a people watcher, I thought, well, I might as well get paid for it. Um, and how did I start on my subject? I think, I think the people watching always comes along with a set of critical questions. Why on earth do we do that? Uh, why on earth don't we do another thing? So for me, the questions were, why on earth do we throw these things away when people are hungry? Uh, why on earth do we let people go hungry in the first place? And I was already thinking about those questions and I was already engaged in the things. I was already saving toothbrushes and backpacks from the op shop. I was already digging things out of the dumpster and then sharing them with people. Um, and then someone had to tap me on the shoulder and say, do you know you can do research about that and you can write about that? And I said to them, can I? That's my life. And they said, yeah, you can make it your research too. Um, and I'm deeply grateful for that because they were absolutely right. Anthropology starts right in your backyard. Hmm. Did you find any answers to why people throw away all that stuff? Mm, that's a two line or a half hour answer. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's cheaper to throw it away than to save it. That's the short answer. Sometimes the exchange value uh, is negligible and the exchange value takes precedence over the use value for a lot of people. So for the shop, if, uh, well, bread is a fantastic example. Bread is really cheap to make. Uh, the labor uh, in the bakery is often, un often underpaid. So bread is really cheap to make. The ingredients are cheap, the labor's cheap. And so they can make a lot of it and then mark it up. So we'll pay a premium for bread that's made fresh that day. And then the day after, we won't pay as much for it. So they can make an enormous amount of bread and the next day it's still cheaper to throw it away and make more. So that's true of bread, it's true of bananas. It's not true of diamonds. They don't throw, throw diamonds away because they've got a fresh shipment in uh, to pop on the shelf. But they throw bread away, they throw avocados, they throw apples away. And they tell you something about how we value the labour of the people who grew it. Um, and it tells you about how much we're willing to pay for the freshest thing, the nicest thing. You know, and it's not just food. I mean, I think food is the most important thing to talk about because there are people who are hungry. But it's computers too, it's phones. Something like one out of every three iPhones in the US that's bought is bought to replace an old iPhone. And then those old iPhones, goodness knows what happens to them. So obsolescence is a question of cultural memory. It's a question of of how we're convinced to value a thing. Um, I think that might answer your question. Mm, so the, the dumpster or the, the throwing away is mm -hmm. a node, if you like, in that mm -hmm. circle of mm -hmm. uh, a product or a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, what's next? Now that you've, you've, you've worked on the dumpster, mm. the politics of mm -hmm. the dumpster, if you like, or the anthropology of what happens with waste, mm. uh, are you going to go backwards and to the growers or forwards to the people consuming? Or There are two directions to go. Um, and they're both to do with the afterlife of the, the thing itself. Uh, one is to look at the way the food recirculates, which I've started to do. Um, I, one, one of the big things that I did besides dumpster diving was work with the soup kitchen. Um, because a lot of it doesn't just get thrown away, it gets donated to 
soup kitchens and food banks and that sort of thing. So it does actually get eaten, it does get recirculated, but it has to be done outside of public view. It has to be done away from the people who might have been potential customers anyway. So I'm interested in what happens to the people who are hungry, who do get reconnected with that food, but in ways that are highly managed. Um, and then I'm interested in land too, because it turns out land gets thrown away the same way as food. In the United States, there are, by one count, up to six empty buildings for every person who's homeless. Uh, and those buildings are empty because they're waiting to be valued differently. They might be, they might be waiting for the, the real estate value of the neighbourhood to come up. Um, but either way, they can't just be opened up to let people stay in them. That would disrupt the whole structure of the market. So I'm interest in, interested in squatting as well as dumpster diving. Um, I'm in, interested in tent cities and, homeless and homelessness and how people shelter themselves outside of a market framework if they don't have the money to shelter themselves. They still stay alive. They still keep a roof over their heads. So how do they do it? And what sort of economy do they, uh, do they live in if they don't have the money to live in a market economy? So food banks. Mm squatters, food and shelter still. Which in a way is addressing most of the social ills <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of major global cities, I guess, is mm. where, where mm -hmm. this is happening at a, at a large, larger scale. Yeah, it's a modest project. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it'll keep you busy, no doubt. Um, <laughs> but do you think that then, then inherent in all the things that you've talked about mm -hmm. is an overarching critique of, and this is coming back to what we started talking about, mm -hmm. an overarching critique of the market as, mm -hmm. as the economic system. Right? Absolutely. And an overarching critique of, of the politics of our mm -hmm. current investment in, in that sort of economy mm. and, and how it, it's always, as you said, it's paraded as the mm -hmm. only uh, mm. version of the economy mm -hmm. uh, we can or should engage. But, but there are others out there. Um, Absolutely. In smaller communities, mm -hmm. sharing economies. Um, mm -hmm gift exchange on all sorts of levels. Mm -hmm. um, so that bigger critique, um, what, wor what role do you think you can play in, in, in shaping that bigger critique and what role anthropology can and should play in, mm. in, 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 in that large scale uh, critiquing of the yeah. system mm -hmm. of that scale? I th well, I think what we've always done has been twofold. I think we've always taken the most noisy and predominant assumptions and taken them apart a little bit and said, mm -mm -mm. it's more complicated than that. And at the same time, I think we've always been a space to amplify smaller voices. So if there are people who, for whom the market is the only way or people for whom uh, growing the economy, creating a, a healthy business climate seems like the only way of, uh, of making a, a healthy happy city. Well, part of what we do is, is we point out that there are already other economies uh, that don't work that way, that in their own way are robust, that in their own way are healthy and happy. Um, and in doing that, we give a bit of space that otherwise wouldn't, uh, those economies and those communities wouldn't find. Mm. So tent cities, squatters, dumpster divers, uh, rogue soup kitchens. These are all people who are already living a new sort of economy. So I think we can make space for them um, and make space to point out that the, or to amplify the fact that they're already pointing out that these things work. Hmm. And there are practical, practical things. I mean, sometimes anthropology comes off as, uh, as a philosophical uh, sort of chin stroking discipline, but there's some really practical insights that come out of that. You know, can you share some with us? I think that'd be a, mm -hmm. a great place to end. Actually, some practical mm -hmm. uh, insights and, and solutions mm. or practical ideas for people to follow mm. um, that you've that you've come across that you've mm. researched. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things we we point out is that our relationship to things is flexible, uh, and that it it can change. So people can, uh, you know, on a really individual level, people can take that on board and and rethink their relationship to the avocado, rethink their relationship to the banana, and maybe just take the spotted one home, um, maybe not look for the perfect one, and you know, maybe, maybe take a more skeptical approach to the 
you know, wherever it was that they, that they learned that they ought to have the best thing, the, the perfect avocado, that sort of thing. Maybe anthropology can give people a bit of license to, to change what they take home from the shops. Um, and it can, I mean, shop, if there's a chicken and egg relationship between the consumer and the shop. Uh, people often say that it's the shop that's, that's putting their things out on the shelves uh, to sort of manipulate our, our aesthetics and then the shops always respond that it's the consumer demand that drives that sort of thing. So anthropologists can talk to both the consumer and the shop and say, well, this is a, a chicken egg cycle that's unnecessary. Actually, you can put the spotty things out for a discount and people will buy those and you won't, you won't operate at a loss. Um, so on that level, I think we can also help people reimagine, uh, you know, the way to design a city, the way to, the way to design uh, circuits of value and, and the way people interact in a city. You know, one of my favourite things about, uh, about the project I've worked on has been looking at these sites of conflict around where food can and can't circulate in the city. And there are these spots where people are afraid of, uh, afraid of homeless people uh, being bad for business, in essence. Well, anthropology can look at that and, and, and treat that fear not as an economic fact, but as a, a cultural fact. Treat that fear as something that's subject to change, subject to perspective. So one of my favourite suggestions for cities, and I'm not sure if anyone will take this, is that rather than uh, try and keep homeless people out of view, they ought to have uh, re-education camps for tourists so they can get a bit more comfortable with homelessness. Maybe meet, meet a homeless person for the day. In fact, maybe just employ homeless people as tour guides. Um, that might be a bit cheeky. Uh, but it's still a, a, it's a way of thinking about how we might do the social relationships that constrain an economy otherwise. Mm. And, and it's interesting that we've come back to relationships mm -hmm. between people, mm -hmm. um, whereas we, st we started with things. Mm -hmm. But things, it seems, uh, are so tied into the relationships mm. between people. Absolutely. And um, I mean, we, we all need things. We need to eat mm -hmm. things, for instance. Um, and we constantly interact with things, give mm -hmm. it to other people, mm -hmm. buy them, etc. But really, uh, and I think this is, it's actually uh, a worthy lesson, probably not just from anthropology, but in general, mm -hmm. is to look beyond the thing to mm. the person you're buying it from, mm. to the person you're mm -hmm. getting something from, and, and reimagining those relationships too, mm. which I think is quite important. Absolutely. Absolutely. The market is not a given. The market is a community of people. Uh, and some people get left out of that community, and some people... Uh, some people make the rules for how that community works. So the market is a group of people swapping things for money. Um, it always, and it always has a face-to-face -face component. Great. What a great place to end. Thank All you right. very much. Thanks very much.